This is our second wonderful day of the seminar. Ah, the people in the audience should not come later than presenters. This is the culture of our partnership. Concentrate on your new working day. And we commence this day with our most wonderful expert, a friend, myself, and Yura and Andre Zaharov. Uh, we have can confirm that he's one of the founders of this school. Because when the school was set up, and it was just a project uh, in the minds of several people, and it was far from being implemented. Jeffrey Hawson, who was a professor of the London University, organized a seminar and were his partners. We brought in a big group of uh, uh, wonderful Russian people. It was 1990, the beginning of December, and the group consisted of uh, nice literary critics, poets, writers, philosophers, and uh, Father Alexander Men and Mirab Mamardashvili. On September 9, Alexander Men was killed. And on October 25th, on November 25th, Mirab died. He went to Belize for several days and left his suit uh, at our place, which he went to put on for uh, our visit to London. I put this suit in the morgue. Anyway, this seminar was quite unique, and last year we published some presentations from that seminar. We were visited by the Princess Anne. For a year, the professor of London University, Jeffrey Hostel, conducted this seminar from abroad. And we did the Russian part, not only the London seminar, but the Galitsan seminars as well. This is a contribution of a scholar, a historian. And this person suddenly believed into a non existent seal project in Russia and became a part of it. So I was awfully upset when we, this year, we weren't allowed to go to Stavropol or Rostov when Jeffrey came in and uh, we were confused because we, we held our tickets because the love to the subject which he studies and the subject is called Russia and the Russian history. And now you will hear the Russian language, which uh, this person made for himself. And you will hear what kind of language it is. And as a matter of fact, uh, the language was learned because he lived in Russia for several months, only uh, a couple of times. His topic uh, of interest is the trust. We published a small book. You can buy it around here. It was ended. And he presented this book to me and I said that I can't read it now because it's hot. And I read the uh, final pages. In the several pages, 
and describe what I uh, felt intuitively. And uh, Jeffrey made it in English, and I will ask Andre uh, to translate this book into Russian. Jeffrey is going to talk today about something what we know the crisis of democracy here, fascist relations, and the crisis of democracy in all Western democracy for different reasons, but it is still a crisis. Any crisis, if you discuss it uh, openly and publicly and scientifically, then you have to do away. You can do away with this kind of crisis. It requires intellectual intervention, and that's uh, what Jeffrey is going to provide us with. Leanna, thanks for your warm and hearty words. This school was invented by us about 25 years ago, and it does exist for 22 years. I participate every year, and this is a miracle. I mean, the fact that this school exists, and it is especially important now because diplomatic relations are worsen from step to step, and we have to strengthen these relations because our diplomats somehow cannot resolve the problem. I named my presentation the crisis of the civil society in the West. Yesterday, Mikhail Sudman described the economic uh, crisis in the European Union and especially in the Euro zone. I will talk to you about consequences of this crisis for the civil society, not only consequences. Um, but uh, what had started before. And in the center of my presentation is the notion of trust. This notion seems to me very important because the social trust, trust of people to each other, trust which is unconscious or subconscious. This constitutes the foundation for peaceful interaction between citizens. If we do not trust the state, how can we uh, protect ourselves from enemies and criminals? Well, at the lower level, ethnical, uh, religious, political groups uh, would, uh, would make their own circles of trust. Or maybe semi military bands. And that's what happens in the Middle East now and in certain countries. Of course, but I don't want to hear it here. Whatever happens in the Ukraine now, this is the proof of what may take place if you do not trust uh, your state, your governments. Uh, recently, Andrew Ron's political observer wrote in you know, the Observer newspaper. He said that the British audience lost trust to bankers, to policemen, to doctors, to priests, to mass media, to BBC, to supermarkets, to national intelligence, and in the first place to politicians. And thus, the politicians recently uh, dramatically went down. I was living in Great Britain now, and there were new rumors that somewhere in the 80s or the 90s, a circle of deputies of our parliament systematically uh, abused children. It's the greatest scandal. How can this be? And uh, what about policemen? They were not interested or what? Uh, in the past, uh, people wouldn't believe it, but now 
people are ready uh, to think that this is true, and that's why there's going to be an official investigation. Uh, the same is true about the European Union in May of uh, this year, and the election to the European Parliament, governments, and establishment uh, parties. In all countries, they were defeated. The less than 40 percent uh, of uh, the elector didn't come to vote, and 30 percent vote for populist parties, for right or left, and even the fascist party, like in Greece and Hungary, where these populist parties openly encourage fascism. Most observers say that people do not trust politicians. That's the formula. And that really means that we are in a state of deep crisis in our civil society. Let us see what are the necessary prerequisites of the civil society and what state they are now. I would love to talk about the Great Britain. But it is true uh, for the EU countries. The first prerequisite is the law and its efficient enforcement. The legal system makes us sure that the conflicts may be uh, resolved peacefully. For a stable society, it's a must. And the key role in ensuring this uh, is played by the state. This sounds paradoxical. Do you have to trust uh, the government? I think that this is very desirable because the state is responsible for law and order. But in a sort of impeccable democracy, you cannot trust the state 100%, 90% is fine, but still there should be some 10%. Because the government consists of regular people, they make mistakes. Um, they think about their own benefits. And this is human nature. But the members of the government have larger capacities for all sorts of abuse. So this 10% of share of mistrust of the government is necessary for a civil society. And that's how the legal state uh, works. The parliament is to observe the activity of the government and inform uh, people if they do something which is not reasonable, not proper. Uh, the parliament should also consider a uh, project, change them, or actually uh, deny them. So, in the legal states, uh, the parliament uh, is of paramount importance. And the second pillar is the judicial system. The judicial system uh, secures enforcement of law in everyday life. Uh, no uh, detailed laws can uh, envisage all possible consequences of this law. So, the court is responsible for enforcement of the law on practice. Everybody is equal in front of the law. And the government members are responsible in front of the law. Now, pillar number three, mass media, and the public requires truthful information presented in a way that normal people can understand it and discuss it. In time of problems, mass media should provide us with ideas about the resolution of such problems. Mass media should secure an open and public discussion. Jordan Habermas, for instance, 
or Amartya Sen. I don't know if these knowns, names are known to you. Well, anyway, these thinkers think in the open and public discussion uh, based on common sense is very important for Indian civil society. Without this open uh, discussion, uh, the public would trust rumors or some extremist or one sided theories, uh, which is dangerous, no doubt. Because people may turn to violence to protect their own interests. Now, all these pillars, like civil society, parliament, the judicial system, and mass media, uh, they are all endangered now. And that's what I want to talk to you about. The legal system and civil society is based on taxes. There is a tax system. Fair taxes cost in the cornerstone of the civil society. Still, the civil society depends on a fiscal agreement, meaning that we all contribute uh, to the state the way we can. And we get in line with our needs. And by the way, Marxism, Marx definition of communism. But this is true about the civil society. So, this idea is performed uh, or is achieved by the tax system. We have to just be criticized the Swedish, Swedish tax system. But I'm going to praise it. Well, he knows better. The legal state has one tax advantage. It is easier for it to use funds for people uh, for taxes. One Russian tax inspector was surprised in the 90s, but he found out how successfully the Swedish state and the other collects taxes. So the Russian guy asked his Swedish colleague, how can you do it? And the Swede answered that his compatriots properly pay taxes because they believe that the majority of compatriots do the same thing. And second, the state honestly spends this tax money for him. The society and the Russian inspectors at the time were in the uh, in Russia, people are not willing to pay taxes because they think that uh, many of the companies do not pay, especially the rich ones, and secondly, corrupt politicians and businessmen take a big share of these taxes uh, for their own personal. Ends, not for public ends. Great Britain now, unfortunately, moves from Swedish model to the Russian model in this regard. Yes, yes, it happens, and I shall tell you why I think so. You know, there is a notion of tax haven. Tax haven helps big companies to avoid uh, their tax responsibilities. Those are offshore tax haven. This is a haven where large companies use secrecy to hide their profits. <laughs> And they make embezzlements in the countries with high taxes and they depose their profits in the countries where taxes are low or where the bank confidentiality is total. So the companies uh, create uh, shell companies. 
and then the system becomes very complicated and for tax inspectors it's very difficult to follow all these complicities. So where these tax havens are located? Uh, unfortunately, many of them are right there in the London cities or in the colonies of former British Empire, in Channel Islands, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, and so on. Not necessarily there. There are other things here in Switzerland, in Luxembourg, in certain U.S. states like Delaware, where in one building in the city of Delaware, one to own a North Orange Street, to find 70,000 companies are registered. And there's a t-shirt of Britain. And we're in Britain. In the year of 2013, Barclays Bank, one of the chief banks of Great Britain, I received a profit of $1.4 billion in Luxembourg and paid taxes there of $20 million, meaning less than 2 percent. And I pay 40 percent. Uh, for, for the most part of my modest uh, profits. And the Northwest Bank pays less than 2%. And the Britain Market Bank received uh, $4.9 billion and paid $55 million. Again, it's 1 or 2%. Uh, uh, Arab Sheikh used in these capacities Russian, uh, Ukrainian, and Chinese oligarchs. These offshore companies allow you not to fight your own uh, funds, but you may mask criminal operations like drug dealing or selling uh, arms to terrorists. Uh, a Russian prosecutor once named the city. A big washer, human money laundering. And probably he is right, unfortunately. It's difficult to find out anything about it because offshore companies, uh, they follow Omerta. This is an Italian bandit uh, word that uh, mafia vow about silence. A journalist once wanted to go through this in my imaginations in one of the offshore companies was told that if we discuss this issue further on, you will find yourself in a, a situation of Salman Rushdie. Uh, Fatka uh, was issued against him uh, in order to kill him because he, well, left the, his confession. And that really means that they say that some of the cases are not to be discussed. And we warn you, this was a former British Empire. And uh, obviously, we did help for such financial operations. Within the last two or three decades, there came new shadow banks. We are not regulated by the states. And they played a very harmful role for the economic crisis of 2007 2008. As a result, large financial institutions and large companies have no response. And from the point of view of the states, they don't go bankrupt. If uh, one such uh, bank goes bankrupt, the national economy system may be undermined. So the state is to give them a helping hand. Do bankers know it? They do. They do. They know that they can take any risk. 
and he will get the benefits or profits. Uh, if the risk is fine, but if the losses are serious, then the state would bail them out. So this is the ideal background for mistrust. The national state saved big banks in 2008. Uh, not Lehman Brothers, but uh, other, yes, uh, in Great Britain and India, the banks were saved. It was uh, 8 or 10 billion pounds uh, in Great Britain, which doubled the national uh, debt. But uh, taxpayers were to pay for it, not banks, especially poor. Uh, the government cut down the social welfare, and many families, uh, if they do not get subsidies for their apartments, they have to move out, especially in London, where the rent is high. And so they had to move uh, to another town where the amount of work is smaller and the amount of unemployment is larger. And employers in London cannot find proper uh, workers or servants who live nearby. Legal terminology and legal jargon. 
and they find it impossible to do it. They may be people who have been recently fired, who lost their jobs for no good reason at all, and they do not even they still complain of wage areas. In many cases, they cannot defend them. Those who may be evicted from homes or from flats, we are especially outraged by what we call bedroom tax. Bedroom tax, what is it? Well, this is a newly imposed tax imposed by the state. It's created from the families of the local government to think that they have too much excess living area. In other words, it's called a spare bedroom or guest bedroom. This measure provides particularly people with disabilities because they need this bedroom for people who are look for caretakers, for those who look after people with disabilities. So they either have to move to a new flat or find the money to pay this tax. And some of them, it's clear, refuse to pay the new tax, which makes local councils um, spend great effort on living small amounts. And this measure affects immigrants who may face deportation. Nowadays, we see improvised banks, food banks, where poor families can, can just get some donations of food, which they cannot afford to pay for. And they're not all of them necessarily people who lost their jobs and unemployed. They're people who work and get very low salaries. And for this reason, they have to seek help from food banks, young people, school livers. Nowadays, they have no right before they're 25 to apply for unemployment benefit. And they also, and they do not have either the right what they call transitional pay. It's when they leave schools, but they haven't started a job yet. It helps go through this stage, get some new skills. Nowadays, they have lost because they've been cancelled. So you can see that nowadays this equality before the law has been undermined, undermined by the government, by what the government did. And another process which is taking place, this is what I call investigation of politics. What I mean is manipulation of politics. It's just that politicians go for things that do not really matter that much. And cannot defend uh, their citizens from politicians. How could it be that in a democratic country the government can cut so bad on the on the expenses and just waste the lives of the poor people? How could it happen in a uh, democratic country. One reason is that the political parties have become weaker. Fifty years ago, two main political parties in UK together had three million members. Nowadays, they only have about 250,000, which means that it is tenfold decrease. And the membership fees have gone down too. But the political process has not become any cheaper, quite the opposite, I suppose. Um, campaigns, election campaigns require huge amounts of money, and there's financial gaps that we see in every political party. They try to fill it in by obtaining money from very rich people. From 2001 2010, 40% of income of our main two main political parties came from 60 individual entities or physical persons who donated large amounts of money, large sums of money uh, to political parties. And since they are in government, these parties try to comply with every wish these companies or individuals might have. The budget for social welfare is 
cut down, the poor people lose what they need. Whereas leading bankers not only get good salaries, but they have good, good bonuses and premium payments for the very modern success or for lack of success at all. Well, lobbyist companies tend as mediators between the rich and the politician. I'm sure you have this notion here. They work behind the scenes and with the government and with the parliament. These lobbyist firms uh, do not report to the public or to the parliament. They conceal their financing sources. They are in dialogue with ministers and influential civil servants, but they always do it in shadow. It's very hard to find any, out anything about Lobbies work in different ways. They do not give bribes, but they implicitly influence any decision taken by the parliament or the government. When a bill is introduced into parliament, these firms help civil servants collect information, provide guidelines and recommendations, and certainly they cover it all with it alongside the interests of their clients. They disseminate ideas and facts in mass media that are profitable for them. They've got what we call think tanks. They are researchers and advisors who write reports in the desired key. They stand in the way and do not allow to go into place with facts that denigrate the clients and they block it and if needed they denigrate their um, opponents and they finance hospitality for people who may be useful to their clients. There is another phenomenon what we call revolving door. Revolving door phenomenon. These are directors of major companies become consultants to government and to political parties. And they certainly cover it all on the light of uh, profit and interest to the, the former company. And senior politicians, they, and when they end their career, become directors of major companies, provide expertise with the technology and provide connections with former ministries. That's helping them obtain government procurement orders. Their influence is seen in many aspects of policy today. When the government does many things, not because the voters, because the electors or the general public want it to be, they rather work for the interests of these companies from which they get financing and funding. A classical example is a long story, this is now history, the lobbies of tobacco company, tobacco industry. In my country, it was back in the 1960s or even 1950s. Medical research in UK showed, with high probability, that smoking negatively affects your health and is linked to lung cancer. This is where the doctors, physicians recommended their to impose some limitations on the sale and advertising of tobacco and cigarettes. Tobacco companies fought against it. British American Tobacco, huge company that mobilized resistance indirectly through lobbyist firms. And these lobbyist firms, they used all those tactics which I've already mentioned. They were challenged. The findings of uh, research claiming that this research doesn't stand to prove anything. And they would say that those who buy cigarettes are adult people, they have the freedom of choice. When they have nowhere else to go, they acknowledge that yes, in few cases, smoking can cause cancer, but it's not typical. This fight went on for 50 years. But indeed, in what we call a semi happy end. In 1998, 46 American states went to court to seek damage that, uh, to compensate the care of all the patients with cancer, lung cancer. And ma major tobacco companies had to pay out $200 billion, which was the highest fine in the financial history. Nowadays, 
because of this victory, legal victory, both in the UK and in America, and it's across, across the world. Tobacco is sold only in uh, just um, very noticeable packaging, which has very big letters saying that smoking kills. Advertising is banned, and smoking in public places and in transport is and do. It's a victory. But the lesson is that we can do is that you can win, but the fight will be very long and stubborn. And you can do it only if you have your own income of um, source and if you can mobilize support of the part of the government operators and masses. Otherwise, you will never gain the victory of the lobbies. And we need to so that the findings of honest scientific research should reach the public. It means that uh, there are mass media who are not 100% biased. And nowadays, lobbies, for example, they support the interests of companies that say, sell sugar and alcohol. Although it is known that um, alcohol and sugar abuse is a hazard, is a health hazard, but there are other lobbies who say, say promote some financial institutions, banks, and they have very good links with the city and and I'm quoting Dave Hartnett, he's a major ser uh, servant in the Ministry of Texas. He was considered to be the most wined and dined official of the White Hall, more than anybody else among his colleagues. Uh, was it for accidentally or not? But the tax inspectorate did not really bother those companies. You have seen how this works. Last year alone, the Conservatives um, set up a ceremonial dinner for people who wanted to invest into and donate to political parties. Admission fee, a ticket, was anything between um, and the list of MVT is secret, but when newspaper obtained it and it turned out that it was this lunch was attended by ten representatives from vessel oil companies, nineteen from PR, forty seven from retail and uh, from tours, real tours, and 73 bankers and financiers. So they do secret business about finances of the Conservative Party. During the next year, the guests who attended that banquet would donate £5 million pound to the Conservative Party. The Liberal Party and the Liberal Democrats cannot compete with such lavish donations. And this year alone, just two weeks ago, at the banquet held by the Conservative Party at an auction, the wife of a Russian oligarch paid £160,000 to play a match of tennis with David Cameron, our Prime Minister. Well, as you see, I don't know if this game, if this match ever took place. So, as you see, and this is a very serious phenomenon, we see the merging of Russian and British oligarchs. We see this merge taking place. And if we say, speak about the global climate change, Scientific research here about climate change is certainly taking climate change is certainly taking place. We don't know the consequences, but in general we can see that this planet is warming. And that responsibility lies with the activity of man, especially in using hydrocarbons. So we must gradually switch to non carbon based energy. Almost all and every country in the world agrees with this, but the lobbies, lobbies of the companies who trade in energy, they do all they can 
to challenge uh, the findings of this research in climate change. And I would like to say that science cannot prove anything 100%. But science can do, it can make forecasts uh, with a certain high level of probability, but never the, that would be 100%. But these lobbies, they really make the public doubt. They say, oh, it's not substantiated, oh, it's not proven, it needs further research. In the UK, the main lobby, Global Warming Policy Foundation, its head is our former Minister of Finance, Lord Lawson, Nigel Lawson, who is, I think, there's no qualification in climate studies, but he's in charge. And therefore, as a result, nowadays international processes to reduce carbon based um, sources is now being stalled. Uh, the public in the UK and US are not sure that we need to continue with this, and politicians also are in doubt, certainly under the influence. So I hope, I hope, I'll give you. Uh, just uh, some kind of understanding this, which why is it that why the crisis of civil society, why we are in jeopardy? What I want to say as I'm wrapping up, what I see today, and Michael Sullivan spoke about it yesterday. This is where they see the crisis with euro and the currency. Again, this shows that there is a conflict between major banks, financial firms, and the public, public at large. Just for example, in Greece, Greece is threatened, is facing bankruptcy. Well, what was it? 2010. When the Greek government, Papadopoulos, wanted to hold a referendum on whether the Greek public agree to the conditions imposed by the Eurozone to save Greece from these debts. This is when the financial markets, they responded, reacted immediately that no. No referendum to Greece, and at the end, the government cancelled the referendum. There's a direct clash between democracy with the financial banking firms. There's in between the very democratic, the very civil societies in the world, the best civil societies in the world. And for this reason, well, I think. As you listen to my presentation, if you listen to what I have to say, probably you, what came to your mind was, oh, he's speaking about things that we well know for quite a while. Why are you telling us such simple things? But the thing is that it's done in our countries, in the West, in Western society. When we just starting the school, Moscow School of Political Studies, we thought that Russia needs to learn a lot from the West, and this is what I thought at the time. But nowadays, the West, in many ways, is not a model to follow. The problem is that Russia and Western countries have many things in common. That is why now I can feel that it's not that we are teaching you. Instead, I feel that by exchanging experienced um, about how to, what to do about these things. Because in a normal society, public life could take place only if we have a strong civil society, which means social trust at a very high level. Corruption is very serious in Russia, even maybe more serious than it is in the Western countries, but corruption is certainly there in Western countries, and it's very serious. And it has common roots, Russian and European problems. As I was saying, we see the merge, merging 
and between Russian and British oligarchs. The last point I wish to make, civil society is not a purpose we all seek to attain. Civil society is an ongoing process, and not only a purpose but a process. The fight for free and just society that never stops, it will go on. Thank you very much. I'd like to have one minute of your time for the question. First of all, first bravo for your analysis of the Western society and many things that we learned from your presentations, but many things that we recognized in your presentation. Two questions. First, maybe we have grown older and we don't like many things for this reason. This could be and one reason. Secondly, because we lived under the spell of illusion, and when we faced a tough reality, these illusions are better than reality, often in the cases like this. Secondly, still, in the Western society, you have independent courts and uh, independent press whips. Well, better for worse, but thirdly, Andrei Alexandrovich Zakharov. He's a teacher, just like he every time gives me something, he gives me a new issue of his magazine. And this is where I read an article by Pierre Manon, who spoke with translated. And Pierre Manon, in his article, put forward the following. The crisis in general, the crisis of democracy today, we can say that this is a crisis of popular representation in favor of the democratic management. Well, this this good governance. In point of fact, it takes away from people their right to vote. And uh, what we probably see in a bureaucratic Brussels, certainly it's better than what was the Soviet Moscow in terms of governance, but it, in its intentions it remains very much the same. So there's something which is fundamentally of just fear. I'm sorry, I've never been there, but it seems to me that an independent court and, and free press and municipal life. If you agree to what I have to say, well, yes, it's an interesting question indeed. First of all, first question is yes, yes. I am uh, have become a moody old man, but grumbling old man. But I want you to, for you to the judge whether I'm right in my unhappiness or is it just illusions of an old man. So you have to take this question. Indeed, I see that. A positive thing about the civil society. Well, the civil society certainly remains with that this is an independent court. But access to this court is now being reduced, but compared. But the courts have very high quality for good reason. The Russian oligarchs, when they went to uh, settle their conflicts before the court, they moved to the UK because this is where they think that they will address this matter without political intervention. And they're right in their assumptions, but if a guy in the street can no longer go to court, then still uh, the usefulness of an independent court is lost. But the very fact that it exists, that certainly matters. Because this is just general background, we rarely go to court. But all our legal matters and business matters, they are done against this background, yes, that this independent court exists. And if needed, if needed, it might be possible to go to court or at least seek support with solicitors. They're not like an advocates in Russian terminology. There's no direct translation, but there are lawyers who can help you. Free press, yes, thank goodness, thank goodness, it's still there, although nowadays in Britain, most newspapers have taken an ultra-right position, what they 
do, I suppose they promote a vicious economic theory. This is a regulating market. They profess the idea that the state should not interfere and should be distanced from business and financial spheres. They are champions of a theory of that we should cut down immigration and and even deport some immigrants that we that already live in my country. So what they do they really um, promote ethnic and racial hatred. I still some good newspapers are around and especially like to highlight the Guardian and the Financial Times. Our oh, uh, conservative government wanted to give murder, you know, this guy, right? He owns many of these TV channels and net papers. And they wanted to give him a greater control over our mass media, but thank goodness the Guardian uh, exposed some of his policies, uh, what his journalists and editors do. And recently, one of his former editors in chief was sentenced to 18 months in prison for hacking. Hacking. That's when you tap on the private telephone call. One of his newspapers did it systematically for many years and they hacked private conversations even on their own family members. And it's a scandal and uh, without that, uh, uh, unless uh, it happened, and the Somalis would have had even a greater control over the mass media. So we have some uh, parts of uh, uh, stable uh, civic society, and thanks goodness, but uh, the government wants uh, to uh, defeat those uh, islands of civic society, and the struggle is quite tough. My request uh, to you is that when you ask uh, your questions, uh, please uh, do not speak uh, uh, fast as you uh, used to. I uh, understand Russian quite well, but uh, when you speak too fast, I cannot understand you <laughs> all the time. So, Anna, please ask your first question. Good morning. I am Anna Ivanova from Iran Slava Line. I have uh, some remark uh, uh, on the crisis of uh, trust uh, and belief uh, um, uh, in Russia, which have the same roots. And we also have the notion of the uh, blind uh, belief. And uh, what you told us uh, um, is quite a paradox. Uh, when the civic society is developing, there is a crisis of the trust in the part of the civic society to uh, some governments. On the other hand, uh, in some totalitarian countries, there is some blind belief and trust uh, on the part of the people to their governments and leadership. So my question is, uh, uh, which government do you think uh, um, uh, has uh, the best, uh, wins the best support and trust uh, uh, with their people now? Uh, thank you. Um, and in my book uh, uh, on trust and confidence that uh, Yelena uh, mentioned, uh, I uh, give a warning uh, that, uh, or I uh, uh, make a reservation that um, uh, it is uh, not uh, um, something that is uh, to be trusted, but uh, I'm right or not uh, trust in trustworthy. And it's true sure that uh, blind trust, the blind uh, belief, uh, is uh, a senseless thing in its uh, best uh, uh, way, and in the worst case, it's uh, something that is harmful. Uh, the worst example is uh, the uh, belief of the Germans uh, in Hitler, and uh, I think that perhaps half of the uh, population of Ger Germany had a blind belief uh, in Germany. I think Hitler really trusted him, specifically during the war times. And uh, in the Soviet Union, um, um, a lot of people died uh, uh, when uh, Stalin died, although. Um, they had some relatives of friends who had been purged, but uh, they had some belief in Stalin, and uh, specifically uh, 
and because of the victory in World War II, uh, which uh, Russia also the Soviet Union won. So they have some reasons to uh, trust Stalin. So it's not so easy, it's a complex matter, but uh, my idea is uh, um, uh, that you need to have a trust uh, in trustworthy. Uh, responding to your uh, question about the government, uh, that's government uh, I really trust. Uh, Schulman said that yesterday they uh, probably uh, is the uh, governments of the Scandinavian countries who, uh, which enjoy the best of trust uh, among their people. And um, it tells us a lot. So, um, uh, uh, some years ago, I could say the same about uh, the British government, um, but that's not the case now. Because uh, and now um, there is a question that why I have to pay uh, 30 or 40 percent of taxes when our richest banks pay only one or two percent in taxes, and that uh, arouses my indignation. And uh, uh, I think many British uh, people share uh, that. Uh, please, your next question. I'm Olga Fadeva from Ukra. Well, uh, while uh, you were talking, um, you said that uh, uh, some uh, acts on the part of politicians undermine trust to the uh, uh, state system, to the government system. So the politicians um, uh, are talking uh, the roots of the tree they sit on. But uh, um, uh, those policy policies are they, uh, the implications of uh, some um, uh, schemes, or uh, is the foolishness on the part of the politicians? Yes, uh, and specifically it's the case about the uh, election campaigns. Politicians promise a lot, but those promises uh, will hardly come true. And, uh, they uh, keep silent on many things uh, they are going to pursue. Well, they have to do uh, because of the influence of uh, major companies or uh, lobbying um, groups. For instance, um, in, in my country in 2010, uh, during the election campaign, the uh, Tories and the Liberal Democrats, uh, who uh, then uh, 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 nursed our uh, uh, struck a union with the Tory the Conservative Party, they said nothing about the would be reforms of the healthcare system. And uh, the, uh, but the moment they came to power, they uh, began opening uh, uh, ways to privatize uh, some areas uh, of healthcare. And the healthcare system uh, is getting more and more privatized, and uh, a lot of uh, British people, as it is known from polls, uh, disagree with that. But uh, the government is pursuing that policy just because uh, they are lobbied by uh, companies, uh, firms, uh, who pay to them for that. It's up to uh, silliness or foolishness. Uh, but politicians uh, feel committed uh, to do so. Uh, they think that uh, there is no alternative because uh, they receive most of the funds uh, from the firms uh, that want those reforms to be pursued. So it's not uh, a stupidity. It's uh, just uh, the way people act uh, when uh, they, uh, they are under pressure, under pressure from uh, some external sources. Uh, question from St. Petersburg behind the corner. I'm Konstantin Krylov from St. Petersburg. Uh, shall I speak English or Russian? I can do both. Okay, I'll uh, ask my question in Russian. At the beginning of your presentation, you said that uh, there was a very alarming signal uh, that traditional political parties and banks are losing trust uh, of people. But perhaps, uh, uh, to a certain extent, it's uh, the uh, manifestation of the common uh, sense, uh, conventional wisdom. Because uh, uh, following uh, World War II, uh, 
and uh, uh, it uh, resulted in a tough uh, um, political system and led to uh, uh, the uh, establishment of the authoritarian center. Although the authoritarian center uh, uh, failed to address all those problems, I'm not going to go into details because it would take another hour to discuss all things, and I don't want to give again uh, any advice to you on that account. But it seems to me that uh, now uh, the Russian state has become too uh, uh, authoritarian and uh, it exercises a uh, uh, control over, say, mass media. So uh, some uh, uh, steps have been um, taken to uh, reduce uh, that uh, central influence because uh, perhaps uh, more authorities to be delegated to regional local authorities. But again, I am not going to give you any recipe. Uh, your uh, question, please. And, uh, so the, you live from, the, from the Mal and Anats uh, district. Jeffrey, uh, you said that uh, over the 50 years uh, of uh, British citizens' participation in political parties and uh, its, uh, the activities have uh, reduced 10 times. And what about NGOs' uh, uh, participation? Um, um, how do the British citizens uh, do with NGOs? Uh, is there any uh, relationship? Thank you very much for an interesting question. And uh, uh, NGOs, non political uh, organizations, um, um, are well supported by uh, the Brits, uh, uh, much more than uh, they support political parties. And it creates kind of a problem since uh, now. I have a lot of uh, what I call semi semi political organizations, and uh, they focus primarily on a single uh, subject. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, global uh, climate change, and uh, some, uh, there are some uh, groups that uh, are trying to have uh, that problem uh, recognized by uh, the world. And uh, while the political uh, parties um, are designed to aggregate uh, um, various uh, subjects and, uh, and uh, come up uh, with a, a general a political uh, cause with that, and if uh, political parties are weakened, uh, uh, there is no other organization that, uh, that can do that aggregation. And those uh, organizations and associations uh, uh, continue working or uh, pursuing uh, their narrow interests, and it brings about a lot of uh, confusion and mess uh, into politics. Uh, besides, uh, uh, very few NGOs and uh, social organizations have, have uh, um, solid funds, and so they cannot compete with lobbying groups. And uh, that uh, leads to uh, uh, piecemeal uh, politics. And, uh, and uh, uh, main uh, uh, civil initiatives uh, are aimed at narrow interests, and nobody, uh, there is no, no other force or groups that do that odd aggregation of all the problems and issues. Here, let's move on. We have uh, a student from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, uh, Blazhenko, by the way, I would like to recommend Blazhenko to you because he uh, can tell you a lot about that miraculous country he lives in. Please uh, uh, don't forget about that. Uh, thank you. I'm Blazhenko. I'm really from Bosnia and Herzegovina. My question when you started talking, you said that uh, uh, in many European countries, uh, fascist um, um, or populist parties enjoy a uh, rise in support. Is it linked to uh, the decay of uh, political culture in those countries? Yes. I think to a certain extent uh, it's true, and it's uh, related to the decay of the political uh, culture, but it's also uh, related to the uh, deterioration of political pro problems. So in the backdrop, more and more people are, are losing uh, elementary rights, uh, as I was telling. People uh, do stick uh, to some uh, more simple explanations of uh, and, uh, uh, hardships and if mass media uh, uh, is 
is uh, malfunctioning and the f- uh, and, uh, uh, customer conventional people uh, are lured into extremist theories and they start believing in uh, rumors and gossips because in public uh, nobody comments on those rumors uh, nobody um, uh, says that it's uh, not true so people are tempted to uh, believe in those extremist uh, uh, theories and uh, they are attracted by uh, those uh, theories and uh, uh, that brings people to uh, violent uh, groups and uh, when uh, Yugoslavia um, uh, uh, collapsed and uh, was disintegrated uh, those uh, uh, things uh, they really came true and uh, uh, people believed in all the rumors and uh, speculations and uh, they were prepared to receive that image of uh, uh, adversary or enemy and uh, they uh, thought that uh, the uh, opposing people were not just their competitors but uh, they were their enemies and uh, they have to fight to them and it's partly it's uh, partially it's because of the decay of uh, the political culture, but uh, um, it's also true that uh, the existing uh, ongoing political and economic problems are uh, deteriorating further and further, and uh, mass media are not providing us with accurate information, and they are not providing us with some ideas how to address uh, those problems. And uh, they uh, come up uh, also with uh, one-sided uh, uh, recommendations or provide one-sided coverage. And uh, that results in the deterioration of all things in political and economic life. Okay, let's move on without questions. Uh, who is stretching that long hand? You, please. And I pass off to from some of spirit. Uh, Russian lobbyism uh, is now having just uh, in, in the bud and um, exercising quite primitive forms. And speaking of the British uh, experience and uh, many uh, thinkers uh, um, and uh, politicians of lobbyism uh, are criticized or criticized by you. And uh, uh, do you have any uh, ideal uh, model of uh, lobbying uh, and uh, uh, whether we need it uh, at all? Uh, okay, so uh, I do believe that when a political party is part of the government and uh, uh, desires to carry out some reforms, that government uh, should be um, uh, in touch uh, with all interested parties. If it's about uh, economic reform, uh, if it is about uh, the reforms in manufacturing, uh, you need to consult um, employers and employees, both. And now, uh, uh, there is only uh, single-sided lobbying efforts, and uh, the government consults only the rich and not the poor, or uh, less uh, protected, uh, more vulnerable parties. Uh, the lobbying firms uh, they are uh, based on some solid foundation and the trouble is that uh, lobbying now is uh, single-sided and uh, uh, for the benefits of the rich only. That's the most uh, dangerous thing, I think. Vadim, uh, your question, please. for a uh, great lecture and uh, I'd like to say that um, uh, when you speak about a crisis uh, it's a uh, good trend uh, and uh, I think that uh, I uh, personally uh, have some uh, experience of working with uh, British uh, human rights uh, activists and I know how successful they are in replicating their experience uh, throughout the world and uh, besides I'm a foreign uh, citizen and uh, without producing any paper, any ID, I um, came to the British Parliament. I had a chance to sit there and uh, listen to uh, all the discussions. To all the discussions. Uh, you cannot be admitted in the same way to the Russian State Duma. 
So uh, it uh, means that um, uh, we have really uh, different positions uh, in the that scene. But I think you made a very correct note that uh, it's not the time when some countries can mentor and lecture on other countries. And uh, certainly we are supposed to join our effort. Perhaps uh, we can uh, stick to the concept of monitoring democracy. Uh, which is getting more and more popular, and, and the role of political parties uh, is uh, being reduced, and that's the global trend. So the focus on the development of civil institutions and uh, on uh, uh, the direct uh, activities uh, such as uh, public expertise, public discussions, uh, public control. By the way, I visited uh, uh, your penitentiary system uh, and. Uh, I saw a uh, civic society people there, and uh, they have keys, and they, they can uh, uh, enter any uh, cell, uh, any room, without any permission. And I think uh, we borrowed that uh, practice uh, for a uh, draft uh, law uh, 67. And uh, with the help of Mr. Brashov, uh, uh, we uh, lobbied, uh, lobbied that effort, and uh, now we have a chance to visit uh, various uh, establishments of the penitentiary, penitentiary system. So uh, it's something positive that we borrowed from your experience, although the, in Britain, uh, it was only in the recent times that the penitentiary system uh, began meeting all European standards. So thank you very much for talking about the crisis, and not many people uh, here in Russia can talk about about um, the crisis in our political system publicly. Thank you very much for that very interesting comment. It's true uh, that I'm uh, issuing uh, some kind of a warning now, and uh, um, I uh, said a very few things about positive features of my society, focusing on criticism only. And there is uh, another opportunity which is related to social media. Uh, they have a chance now to exercise political influence in a different way. I didn't say about that, but um, I'm a member of um, um, the 38 Degree Society, and uh, I don't uh, really know why uh, that's the name of the group. But um, uh, I'm receiving um, uh, some um, mail from them on a daily basis. Uh, for instance, last week I signed their appeal uh, to the government um, not to let, uh, or uh, in other words, uh, to stop selling uh, uh, nicotine. Uh, rich substances which uh, uh, may uh, have a very bad impact on bees. And some uh, MPs uh, in the UK now would like to impose uh, some uh, restrictions on the uh, uh, distribution of those uh, harmful substances. Uh, it's not uh, the desire of the government. And, uh, they, uh, I uh, want to um, lift that, uh, to those restrictions. And I joined the bill uh, to uh, limit uh, um, this uh, distribution of those substances. And 147,000 people signed that appeal uh, along with me. And is that made the government change, up, change their minds. So those restrictions stay. And uh, this is just an example uh, of how we can uh, form the um, counter um, um, some undesirable actions uh, on the part of the government. And uh, if uh, in social media 100,000 or 200,000 people sign such appeals, the government will be made uh, to change their minds because they don't want to lose uh, uh, their voters. And uh, so opportunities are still there, um, and uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, make a better use of, some, of such opportunities in the future. Okay, we have uh, some more minutes to go. You please sit at the window. I'm Anton Pagoritsev from Krasnoyarsk region. Yesterday, we uh, had a discussions uh, on national interests and their impact 
Um, and we uh, believe that both domestic and foreign policy should pursue the national interests in the first place. Uh, in the UK, a successful example uh, 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 how a country can demonstrate uh, their special status. Uh, the UK enjoys uh, special status in the European Union just uh, for the purposes of uh, securing their national interests. Uh, uh, do you think it's uh, really uh, in the interests of uh, uh, the UK? And uh, can you comment on the uh, uh, domestic and foreign policy pursued by the government in recent years and what uh, the British citizens uh, have received uh, from that? Well, that's the subject of heated debate in the UK, so I cannot give you just a simple answer. First of all, we need to define national interests. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Adamishans, uh, Minister Adamishans said that we should differentiate between national interests and the, um, uh, the country's interests from uh, the interests of the ruling circles. I'm tempted to believe that many um, initiatives of the government uh, um, now really show the interests of the uh, ruling top and the uh, ruling circles and rich uh, firms, companies, banks, and uh, they run counter to the interests of the conventional people. And I uh, already shared some illustrations with you. But uh, anyway, uh, you are right about the uh, British uh, demand uh, to enjoy a special status uh, in the European Union. It's not a Eurozone, and, uh, but uh, there are more, um, eight more countries uh, who um, are not in the Eurozone and who are not part of the Schengen uh, Agreement. Uh, UK is uh, kind of an offshore uh, in the European Union. But uh, we uh, also saw some new threats in the horizon of the political life. Since uh, two ministers in the government say that they don't want to, um, to, uh, uh, to fulfill uh, the decisions taken by the uh, uh, European Court on Human Rights, and unless uh, we uh, are subordinated to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it would automatically mean that we would uh, have to uh, leave the uh, European Council. Uh, and the UK was one of the founders of the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, and actually, the charter of the uh, Council of Europe was drafted by the British lawyers. And uh, if uh, uh, we withdraw from that Council of Europe, it would be a disaster for the Britain, and it would be uh, very uh, problematic for the rest of the Europe. And, uh, uh, But it's not in the interest of the society, uh, it can be in the interest of some rich firms, uh, but uh, that's uh, kind of the wrongdoing on the part of the uh, government. Uh, as uh, uh, Minister Under Mission put it, it's in the interest of the ruling circles rather than um, uh, the people. Uh, the colleagues, a few words in conclusion. First, so, uh, Jeffrey Hoskins uh, drew our attention to one very important thing. It's uh, frequent uh, when we think of uh, globalization as economic and cultural processes, but uh, it's a political process as well. And the fact that the Russian democracy uh, is found in that very odd uh, situation is very closely related to the fact that democracy, people's power and self-governance uh, and civic societies uh, in the West, which uh, are something, uh, some kind of example uh, for, the, uh, for Russia, is uh, undergoing a crisis. And in this sense, uh, Jeffrey's uh, remarks are very important to us. Secondly, uh, Jeffrey Hoskins is a very prominent expert on Russian history, and um, 
fact that uh, a historian uh, speaks of the crisis in the civil society and trust today is uh, very, very um, important. And uh, it's uh, uh, really a reason for me to recommend to you that you read uh, books by John Hoskins. I was very much ashamed when Yelena um, referred to some episode of his book. And uh, an uh, excited uh, youth, uh, unstoppable uh, demonstrator, rallied um, uh, there, uh, calling for uh, the denial of any opportunity for Jeffrey Hoskins uh, to visit their land. And I think that's a very shameful episode of Russian history. And secondly, unlike uh, some other uh, experts of the school, uh, there, there is no reason, there is no ground for Jeffrey Hoskins uh, to blame him of some uh, position uh, which in the Russian press is referred to as uh, Russophobia. The gentleman uh, really knows the subject and you can easily be convinced in that uh, just by reading his books and he belongs uh, to the cohort of the foreign um, uh, experts who believe that their works are to be read in the country they write about. I know a lot of experts who are not, uh, who pay uh, no attention to that and who they write uh, in English for English uh, uh, reading, uh, speaking people and uh, the books are published uh, in those countries. But Jeffrey Hawkins uh, writes his book and uh, a lot of them uh, are published in this country. Some of them uh, uh, already uh, became uh, bestsellers and uh, it's hard to buy them to find them in a bookstore. Please uh, read those books. Uh, they are very um, educating. And speaking of uh, the trust in the uh, sixth uh, uh, issue of um, the uh, magazine, we um, published uh, a lot of materials on the loss of, uh, loss of price. There are trusts in the Soviet Union and uh, Russia and uh, Jeffrey Hoskins moderated at that conference. Uh, so it means that uh, we were really lucky to have uh, Jeffrey Hoskins uh, today. And please uh, read his books, and uh, we are very lucky to have him as an expert in our school. Let's thank him for his contribution. Thank you. We have half an hour break.